Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us during this tumultuous time. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's presentation on the uses of histotripsy between cancer and neurological diseases. Today, we hear from Dr. Zhen Zhu, an Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Michigan. Please bear with us as we rework our webinar setup due to the COVID-19 restrictions currently in place. If you are dialing in from a phone and are having issues with your audio, please consider joining the meeting using your computer audio if possible. If your connection is lost entirely, please simply log in again through the link you received when you registered. You will receive a link to a recording of the webinar as well. If you'd like to ask a question of Dr. Zhen Zhu, please submit it via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will collect these questions until the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Zhen Zhu. Dr. Zhu's research focuses on developing new ultrasound techniques for the treatment of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and neurological diseases. She and her colleagues have developed histotripsy, the first image-guided ablation technique that is non-invasive, non-ionizing, and non-thermal. Dr. Zhu's work spans basic science, device development, preclinical investigations, and clinical translation of histotripsy. Dr. Zhu, floor is yours. Thank you, Kelsey, for the kind introduction. And I also want to thank everyone for joining me today. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about histotripsy uh, therapeutic ultrasound technology for treatment of cancer and neurological diseases. Uh, just a quick disclosure, I'm a co-founder and hold stock in Histosonics. A little history and background here for histotripsy. What is histotripsy and where it comes about? Uh, so histotripsy uses ultrasound to mechanically liquefy the target tissue into a cellular debris. And histotripsy term actually came about in 2002. So that's why I was doing my PhD dissertation with uh, Dr. Charles King at University of Michigan. And he actually coined the term um, because all the medical term is based in Greek. So histo means soft tissue in Greek and the tripsy meaning breaking down. So it really refer to a process where we actually mechanical break down the soft tissue to parallel with uh, lithotripsy, which also uses ultrasound to break up kidney stones. So litho means stones in Greek. Uh, and it was motivated when uh, I remember in 2001, we had a cardiologist came to us and said that, uh, and his name is, uh, is Dr. Ludomirsky. Uh, so he was asking, saying that um, all the existing minimal invasive or non-invasive approach at the time. And, and even now they are mostly thermal based to where use various of different forms of energy to heat up the tissue and cause tissue necrosis, such as radio frequency, microwave, or, or ultrasound. Uh, but he was looking for a technology that's non-invasive, but allow the clinician to actually physically remove tissue to perform a real surgery as he described it. Uh, so that's actually motivated development of, of histotripsy. And the histotripsy uses high pressure, short pulses at low duty cycle, below 1%. And that's kind of distinction uh, between histotripsy and the high food. So low duty cycle, where duty cycle is ultrasound on time divided by the total treatment time, uh, using a low duty cycle below 1% allows us to reduce and minimize the heating, where HIFU thermal therapy uses ultrasound, uh, either continuous wave or ultrasound trains, but a high duty cycle to actually purposely heat the tissue. There are two kinds of uh, uh, histotripsy processes in general. Uh, one is the histotripsy process that we have developed at the Michigan, uh, where sometimes it's termed as a cavitational histotripsy, uh, high pressure and really high peak neck pressure, typically above 20 megapascal, and microsecond lens pulses are used, uh, where the central frequency uh, of the ultrasound is in the range of about 200 kilohertz to three megahertz. And they use that the low duty cycle and that pulse train allows us to generate a cluster of cavitation microbubbles. And this inertial cavitation that's generated uh, with a rapid expansion and collapse of the microbubbles results in mechanical 
disruption of the cellular structure and the liquefaction of the target tissue uh, and you know, this whole histotripsy results was the first paper that published in 2004. So another process termed as boiling histotripsy developed at University of Washington, and this slide is provided by uh, Dr. Tanya Kokloff, um, where they describe a process uh, where also using short ultrasound pulses, but using milliseconds long pulses. And with a peak natal pressure in the range of 10 to 16 megapascal, so lower, but with a really high positive pressure. So it's a shock wave with a peak positive pressure in the range of 60 to 100 megapascal. And that allow rapid heating of the target tissue, reaching 100 degrees in several milliseconds and generating vapor bubbles. And that process and generation of the vapor bubbles also allow liquefaction of the target tissue and the similar bio effects of uh, disruption, mechanical disruption of the target cells into acellular debris with process initially published uh, in to, uh, 2013. Um, so in this talk, I want to focus on uh, the process, uh, uh, the cavitational histotripsy process. So first I want to show a video, just give you a visual. I, I like videos and movies and you can visually see it. And uh, here, this video is an in vitro uh, pulsing cardiac tissue and uh, in the water tank. So it really allow you to see visually what's happening to the tissue here. And the ultrasound transducer is placed about eight centimeter away and the focus to the location here. Uh, and you can actually, See once it starts, you can visually see. Okay, you can hear the sound of some stars, and you can visually see the uh, smoke that comes out. And that smoke is actually not real smoke, it's the acellular debris that histotripsy generated uh, uh, from the histotripsy process. And in the water tank, it's the debris is so fine and it's actually moving up. So, this is a real time movie video. Within a minute, you can see uh, about a millimeter diameter perforation, well confined, was generated through this in vitro porcine atrial wall tissue. Uh, and it's uh, uh, almost like a real surgery. And it is like a real surgery where the tissue removal is actually achieved. And when histotripsy is applied to within a bulk tissue, uh, what happens is that the volume of, uh, and this is a single point treatment, single fo uh, focal treatment, and the volume tissue is liquefied such that you can easily scoop it out or uh, extracted by a needle. And if you're looking at the histology with the acellular debris in there, and you can see at the boundary where there are intact cells, and within the treatment region, the cells are disrupted. There's no cellular membrane, no cell nuclei, no cell structures really into this acellular debris. And it's very telling, and I, I love this to uh, show this uh, histology slide, is because at the boundary, you can even see here, there's a half of the cell, and the other half is bisected by the microscopical or microbubbles uh, with really high accuracy. It's not like we can aim a cell and say we're going to cut that cell. Uh, because uh, what, uh, there's you know, imaging accuracy and treatment accuracy is not such yet, but the effect is that it can actually bisect uh, the cells uh, because our effective uh, agent or effective scaffold here is actually microbubbles. So the first thing first, uh, when we started looking at this is, so it took us a while to figure out how does histotripsy work. And there are two parts of it. One is how is cavitation generated by histotripsy in a very controlled and predictable manner? And the second is how does histotripsy disrupt cells? Um, and this is, uh, you know, all the work I'm presented here is really a work by, not just by me as, uh, and by my group, is in collaboration with a large number of people. Uh, and then for the mechanism, I've collaborated with Charles Kane, Tim Hall, Adam, Eli, 
and there's just a key person uh, at Bright Folks and there's a number of people uh, we collaborate with, those are the key people here. Um, and first question, when we started uh, by working on hysterotripsy uh, at the time, uh, I remember it was 2001, that at the time, his uh, captation was really viewed as this random process that cannot be controlled. So the first uh, big question that we were facing was is how can we control the uh, hysterotripsy process or how can we control the captation generation? And in our body, you know, outside the lung, we all breathe in air and lung feature filter the air. Uh, but in our body, we actually have a lot of gas in our body and they are nanometer gas pockets, very stabilized with really high surface tension around about uh, 300 atmosphere. So, so it's really high. Um, and without using, so hysterotripsy process, we don't use any injected contrast agents or micro bubbles. So we are using those nanometer gas pockets that's already endogenous in our body. And then we found out that if we actually using negative pressure, if we can transiently trans, uh, to exceed, you exceed the negative pressure, negative pressure means that the pressure outside the gas pockets would be lower than the inside of the gas pockets using the ultrasound. And that allows, if the pressure is high enough, that can overcome the surface tension of the nanometer gas pockets. That allows to instantaneously expand and grow the nanometer gas pockets to micro bubbles, 100 micron. And we're talking about this explosive growth of 100,000 times. Uh, using ultrasound pulses. And then we tested, and actually Adam did this study uh, while he was uh, in my lab, at Maxwell, and he tested that and showed that uh, if you, you know, looking at all kinds of tissue, and in our body, mostly our tissue is water-based. So you look at the uh, different, you know, blood clots, uh, fresh clots, old clots, uh, different concentration, uh, and uh, kidney, liver, heart, a wide range of tissue type. And what he found out is that uh, if uh, the cavitation threshold using just one single pulse of one cycle, if we can actually exceed in the range of 26 to 28 megapascal that intrinsic cavitation threshold, if we can actually apply that pulse, microsecond, one cycle, ultrasound pulse, exceed that threshold, that every single time, cavitation can be reliably generated by a single ultrasound pulse. And how you achieve that peak negative pressure, you know, you, you can achieve it when you have one cycle pulse and purely by peak negative pressure. There's also a process called the shock scattering. I'm not going into it. Um, but the key thing here is to have microseconds length pulse with negative pressure effectively exceeding this intrinsic cavitation threshold. So by using that, we learn how to generate cavitation in a very controlled manner. And the second question is, how does hysterotripsy disrupt cells in the target tissue? And that was achieved, uh, and that was investigation, and Eli played a, a major role in, in this work. And in this video here, what you're seeing here is uh, a 3D uh, tissue structure with one layer of clear tissue mimicking gel, and then a layer of uh, breast cancer cells, and those are the white, white circles here. So a layer of cells, and not another layer of uh, tissue mimicking gel on the top. And this allow the cells to be sitting in a 3D tissue structure, but we can see them under the microscope. And then we use the high-speed uh, camera to record the bubble cell interaction. So the black structure here you see are the bubbles generated by hysterotripsy and it is actually at the boundary of the cavitation bubble cloud. And they are, you know, the, each cell is about 20 micron here and several micro bubbles are actually clustered into, coalesced into one big blob here. But what you can see is when the bubble actually expand, the cell gets squeezed. And then when the bubble actually 
uh, collapse, the cell actually get pulled away, pulled apart. So really it's a high mechanical strain and a stress that induced by the cavitation, this rapid uh, explosive ex uh, growth and the collapse process that allows us to mechanically disrupt the uh, cells. And only the cells within the cavitation region and immediately surrounding the cavitation microbubbles. And each, part, each pulse actually generates part of the cell disruption. And then you require multiple pulses to really liquefy and mechanically completely disrupt the, all the cells within the target region. And another thing here is that uh, uh, we use microseconds lens pulse. The reason is that uh, that allows us to reliably generate cavitation. However, uh, and the bubble expansion and collapse process, the time takes about several hundred microseconds. Uh, then it takes time for the residual bubbles to dissolve. Uh, however, if you expand that pulse length longer and you know, milliseconds are much longer, then the bubble activity can continue going but become really chaotic and uh, uh, less controllable. Uh, another thing about this low duty cycle used in the hysteresis process, uh, one is to reduce heating, but another important factor to have that long time between the microseconds length hysteresis pulse pulses is that this allow the time for the cavitation bubble and residual bubble fragments to dissolve such that it does not actually impact the activity of the cavitation generated by the next pulse. So now we learn to understand how hysteresis works uh, and um, this slide shows uh, the instrumentation uh, used for hysteresis. So what I'm showing here is actually a Gene 1 hysteresis system manufactured by hysterosonics. Uh, the hysteresis system in general, in a way is similar to the HIFU system. So it contains a ultrasound therapy transducer. And in the center of this, it has an ultrasound imaging probe. It's because the cavitation generated by hysteresis can be clearly viewed on ultrasound imaging. So hysteresis is treatment is typically guided by ultrasound imaging. So uh, ultrasound imaging probe is inserted in the center so, such that it can actually view the therapy plane in real time. And in the Gene 1 system, there's a mechanical arm uh, coming out with a motorized positioner, uh, micro positioner that can be used to actually move the therapy transducer and controlled by the joystick here. And then all the driving electronics for the therapy transducer, ultrasound imaging probe and the uh, uh, positioner are all in this compact cart here. Uh, so it looks, uh, you know, it's slightly bigger than a typical ultrasound imaging system uh, with the software inside integrate the control of therapy imaging and positioning. Uh, and the really the key part here is the, the driving electronics for the therapy transducer allow us to generate that really high pressure microsecond lens pulse. Uh, but such a system is really compact that can be easily moving and out of the operation room for procedure. Uh, again, for coupling, it's similar to a high food procedure, we just use a uh, degassed water for the coupling. So I'm going to show a video demonstration of the hysteresis system in action, demonstrated by Dr. Gabe Owens, uh, who is a cardiologist. And I hope, and with this, you will get an idea how this actually works. This system is a complete ultrasound system here with the, both an imaging transducer and a therapy transducer to deliver therapeutic ultrasound pulses. Over here we have a phantom or a replica of what a, the anatomy of a human, a baby He's torso would be. And a, we have a, a therapeutic torso. cartridge placed in that is a target the to show how this therapy system works. And, gel and then show. place the transducer pieces. So you can imagine the, the transducer picks up the Now utilizing like the that. micro positioning system, we can take our crosshairs or our target and position that onto our... So the cro uh, red crosshair showing the focus. Now that we've got our crosshairs on our target, we're going to go ahead and initiate therapy. 
I'll get a confirmation on the screen. I will say yes. There is Which a is bubble a cloud bright structure here. forming on the interface that we see at the crosshairs. And after two minutes of therapy, we would stop and then we can remove our cartridge and we should see a lesion through the red blood cell phantom, which would represent our atrial septal he's defect. To, he's showing the demonstration where using the MI, uh, the ultrasound guided hysterotripsy system to generate a really precise uh, lesion through all the uh, rib cage and everything uh, of that uh, human phantom. So now showing how uh, hysterotripsy works and the, the instrumentation, uh, I want to talk about two applications in today's uh, webinar. One is for the brain and one is for the cancer. So first for the brain applications. Again, it's really a work with a large team here uh, and that I have the fortune to work with. Uh, Dr. Aditya Pandey from the neurosurgery at University of Michigan, uh, Doc No, Tim Hall, Johnson Sukovich, Charles King at BME, and uh, those are you know key people here. So brain is really an active research area for focus ultrasound. And there are three uh, big uh, mechanisms so far that have been active research and also the clinical trials along. One is uh, uh, thermal ablation. So for using ultrasound delivered outside the skull, transcranial ultrasound, and get it by MRI, we can, uh, can be used to actually achieve precise thermal ablation through the skull completely non-invasive, which is really, uh, really uh, uh, from research and technical side, is really amazing. Um, then the second is a blood-brain barrier. So ultrasound, the transcranial ultrasound can also be used to open up the blood-brain barrier um, temporarily for drug delivery. And third is uh, using a lower pressure, lower amplitude ultrasound for neural stimulation. And targeted disease uh, include a really a wide range of different neurological diseases. Essential tremor is the one that's already approved uh, inside tech system, approved by FDA, uh, and clinically have been treating and benefiting a number of patients. Uh, clinical trials are also ongoing for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, brain tumors, and other neurological disorders. Uh, for focus ultrasound, uh, transcranial focus ultrasound for the thermal approach, I mean, even though it's really amazing I can really achieve a non-invasive transcranial ablation, because the skull is highly absorptive and uh, highly attenuative uh, of the ultrasound energy going through it, um, with, uh, you know, in order to generate heating inside of the brain, uh, the skull can be overheated. And that limits the treatment location and the volume of the MI guided focus ultrasound uh, using the transcranial approach. Uh, and really, uh, you know, with a you know, thermal mechanism, you can only treat the deep targets uh, and also a small volume. And that, uh, that actually preclude a majority of the uh, cortex where a brain tumor can often reside. And we think the potential advantage of transcranial hysterotripsy that we are working on is that hysterotripsy does not rely on heating of the brain. It actually generates cavitation and it uses a very low duty cycle. And uh, we can use low duty cycle even below 0.1%. And that allows us to mitigate the skull heating, uh, minimize the skull heating while still achieve effective cavitation and treatment effect within the brain. And that allows us to treat a large range, a wide range of locations and the large volumes. Uh, so we develop in our group, the Gen 1 transcranial hysterotripsy system. So there are two of them. One uh, is a 250 kilohertz, the other is 500 kilohertz. And both are 256 element hemispherical array with th 30 centimeter diameter and 15 centimeter focal distance. Uh, so it's actually built with uh, 3D printing. Uh, with this array, uh, we conducted some initial experiments and first to demonstrate a treatment profile and the volume. Uh, as I described by using a really low duty cycle, hysterotripsy is able to actually treat through excised human skull to, for a wide range of locations, both the deep targets as well as 
collocations close to the skull as close as five millimeter away from the skull. Uh, it also can be used to treat a volume target. And here shows a four centimeter diameter in vitro bovine tissue that was treated uh, using the histotripsy through excised human skull within 30 minutes. Uh, and we also measured the temperature increase in the skull and showing that uh, even up to an hour of treatment, the temperature increase to the skull is within four degrees, which is not sufficient to cause biological damage. So we are able to treat a wide range of locations, locations near skull surface and treat a volume target through excess human skull without overheating the skull. Uh, there was a concern that because his tripsy generates mechanical tissue disruption. So there was a concern that in the brain, it may actually cause extensive bleeding or edema. So we actually uh, conducted a uh, in vivo safety study in the porcine brain. This actually was supported by Focus Ultrasound Foundation uh, and collaborated with the Focus Ultrasound Foundation. So in this study, uh, we actually removed part of the pig skull just because the pig skull is so flat and thick and not meaningful for the ultrasound to go through. Uh, and then uh, suture back the skin. So the ultrasound that was applied from outside the skin into the intact brain tissue and generating different kinds of lesions, a single patch and, and even block M. Um, because we're from Michigan, we, we have a tendency of uh, uh, putting M wherever we can do it. <laughs> Uh, so MRI images show that the lesion generated by histotripsy within the in vivo porcine brain is really well confined. So you have, uh, you know, showing those bleeding zone, but they are well confined within the ablation zone, treatment zone. Uh, and this is a gross morphology where the pig was survived for three days. And three days later, gross morphology shows that the lesions also is well confined within the treatment zone. So this demonstrates the initial safety such that uh, we do not observe any extensive bleeding or edema outside the treatment region in the brain. We started, uh, you know, with this initial safety study, we started looking, investigating transcranial hysteropsy for different brain applications. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple here. One is intracerebral hemorrhage or hemorrhagic stroke. And what it is is that the uh, vessel in the brain actually disrupt and bleed out and cause uh, clot formation. Uh, and for those patients, the current treatment is that one is medical monitoring, so doing nothing, or highly invasive surgery to resect the clot. Um, and there's a minimal invasive approach too, where a catheter is inserted into the clot and dripping in from political drugs to liquefy the clot and drain it out. And this really minimizes the damage in terms of not cutting through the brain. But however, uh, you know, it, it's really slow. It takes several days for the clot to be liquefied and drained out. And there is a secondary injury occurring within those time. Uh, and the patient had a catheter connected uh, during the several days. So what we have been showing is that using histotripsy applied from outside the skull, transcranial histotripsy, we can liquefy the clot really quickly up to 16 milliliter per minute. So this allows us to liquefy a large clot within several minutes without damaging outside, uh, damaging the spring tissue surrounding it. We actually purposefully leave a rim of the clot uh, intact so that we don't damage the brain and allow the drainage of the clot quickly to uh, minimize the secondary injury to the brain. Uh, we performed also an uh, in vivo experiment in a porcine intracerebral hemorrhage model to demonstrate the initial safety and the feasibility. So what you're seeing here, uh, you're seeing here is an MRI image where we have the clot that in, uh, injected into the pig brain, uh, and then treated the clot, uh, leave a rim of the untreated uh, clot there to avoid damage to the surrounding intact brain. 
Uh, and this is a history showing untreated clutch and the treated clutch. We survived the pig for seven days and then uh, checking for any adverse effects uh, and, and they were doing fine. Uh, so that demonstrates initial safety and feasibility for the intracerebral hemorrhage application. And second is uh, we have developed a MI-guided transcranial hysteropsy system. Um, and this is a chain two transcranial hysteropsy system. And in this system, we have uh, same geometry, 30 centimeter diameter hemispherical array, but with 360 elements uh, and highly packed, so higher packing density. This allows us to increase packing density uh, and increase the uh, element number, allow us to double the pressure output through the skull so we can actually achieve, theoretically, can we measure it, but through the skull achieve uh, 150 megapascal um, and allowing this uh, high pressure range also allowing us with an uh, increased element account allow us to be able to treat a large volume, generating cavitation through a large volume using electronic steering only. Uh, and we can treat up to 100 milliliter with electronic focal steering only, and that's about um, six centimeter in diameter. So really a good range uh, through the skull. On top of that, oh, the system you see here, actually, uh, this is uh, all the driving electronics. So this is a ray. Uh, and we also added receive capability to the hysteropsy array, meaning that the hysteropsy transducer, uh, transcranial hysteropsy transducer can actually transmit and receive signal. And this allows us to do cavitation mapping through the skull uh, and the reflection signal from the skull uh, also can be received to map the skull surface that allow us to actually co-register our cavitation mapping to MI or CT scan of the brain. Uh, we conducted, so we're in the process actually of doing uh, uh, in vitro, in vivo porcine brain study uh, again, supported in, by Focus Ultrasound Foundation. Uh, and in this study, uh, we are using the transcranial hysteropsy system treating through an excised human skull and then into the pig brain. So here again, part of the skull, pig skull is removed, skin sutured the back, uh, now in the MI scanner. And MI guided the transcranial hysteropsy were used and were able to generate precise, well-confined lesions in the in vivo porcine brain as shown on MRI image. Uh, and that's, uh, this is two hours later after treatment. Again, the lesion is well-confined uh, and we didn't you know, see excessive bleeding or edema. So just a summary for the uh, brain applications. Uh, we were able to show transcranial hysteropsy can be used to treat a wide range of locations and the volume in the brain without overheating the skull. Uh, and we demonstrate the initial safety and the feasibility of using MRI-guided transcranial hysteropsy system. And we also actually constructed a transcranial hysteropsy system guided by neural navigation system too, uh, demonstrated some initial safety, but uh, the uh, testing and the study is still ongoing. So the second application I want to talk about is uh, cancer treatment. And this is a study, uh, really a group effort in collaboration with uh, the surgery radiology at University of Michigan and radiology department at University of Wisconsin, the Barcelona University Hospital and the Histosonics. And we chose liver cancer as a first clinical target. And when I talk about liver cancer here, we refer to both the primary and the liver metastasis. And the reason we chose liver cancer first target is because one, the patient population is large. Uh, and there's also a high percentage of surgically inoperable tumors, so 70 to 90%. And because of that, ablation is already a clinical standard treatment for liver cancer, uh, such as microwave ablation, uh, radiofrequency ablation, but due to technical uh, limitation and a lot of limitation, 
uh, even the current minimal invasive ablation technology can also treat, can only be treat, used to treat a limited patient population around the 50% also. Uh, histotripsy as a non-invasive, non-thermal, and non-ionizing uh, approach uh, has a potential to actually overcome many of the limitations of the current ablation technology. And I'm going to talk about histotripsy for liver cancer treatment in preclinical studies using large animal normal liver, as well as small animal liver tumor model, and end with a phase one clinical trial that was recently conducted. First, uh, histotripsy in normal porcine liver, human scale uh, large animal model. So this is in a collaboration with uh, University of Wisconsin group uh, with Dr. Fred Lee, Tim Zellwes <coughs> and uh, uh, Paul uh, Lasky. And really th this has been a um, great collaboration uh, that we have had. And Eli and Johan also have conducted the PIC study at the University of Michigan. So here, uh, and I also want to uh, thank Fred and Tim to sh sharing some of the slides that I'm showing here. Uh, so here we are showing first is uh, ultrasound B-mode image during the histotripsy treatment so that you can appreciate how you know, the treatment goes. So above the arrow here is actually the cavitation generated, which is a bright spot. So first, we want to answer the question, can histotripsy treat through intact chest and ribcage? And here is treating through intact chest of the pig and a part of the ribcage and generating this uh, well-confined cav uh, cavitation zone. And then the focus is to scan through a volume to cover a volume target. So during the treatment, you really can use ultrasound, can see the cavitation well. Um, and then after treatment, histotripsy generated ablation zone can be visualized on MRI, on ultrasound, and actually on CT2. So this shows a T1 weighted MRI image of the histotripsy ablation zone right after treatment, uh, which is uh, uh, about three centimeter diameter spherical area region volume that was uh, treated within 30 minutes of histotripsy. Uh, this shows uh, uh, M shaped, uh, we can control the shape and the size of the treatment zone really well uh, on MR, uh, ultrasound. And uh, uh, because we are uh, reducing, disrupting this tissue into a area debris, so we're really reducing the cell uh, sound sketchers, uh, which can be shown on ultrasound image. So we can provide a real-time imaging guidance and the monitoring of the histotripsy process. And this acellular debris that generated by histotripsy, uh, they actually, uh, they're absorbed by the body really quickly. So this actually shows the MRI image showing that immediately post-treatment, this is ablation zone. Then four weeks afterwards, uh, the acellular debris is reabsorbed and cleared out by the body, body through the normal metabolism process. And the histotripsy, also another feature of histotripsy is uh, tissue sec selectivity. Um, because the damage generated by histotripsy is caused by the cavitation induced mechanical damage and different structures, tissue structures has different thresholds for cavitation induced mechanical damage. We found that tissue with lots of collagen and fibrin are more resistant to cavitation-induced mechanical damage, such as bile ducts, urethelium, bowel, and vessels. While tissue are more cellular, such as a tumor, uh, are more resistant, or uh, actually uh, uh, easier to destroy. So very susceptible to the histotripsy damage. And because of that, we're able to actually preserve bile ducts uh, and uh, large, normal blood vessels within the treatment area while the actual other tissue surrounding it are disrupted to a cellular degree. So we demonstrated that histotripsy can actually achieve 
uh, precise ablation uh, through intact test and rib cage in large animal model. Then we started looking into the effect of histotripsy in a tumor model. And we studied histotripsy in rodent tumor model. And this is a study where we collaborated with uh, Dr. Cliff Cho and Michelle Lala at University of Michigan, their group. Uh, and then we did a different series of studies. The first study um, we did was in a rodent, a rat uh, liver tumor model uh, that's orthotopic and uh, immunocompetent, so they have an intact immune system. Uh, so in this study, particular study, there are two cohorts. The first cohort of study uh, where there's a tumor in the liver and we target the tumor and uh, uh, did ablation with a margin to cover uh, entirely target the, the entire tumor. And in that group of uh, rats, uh, nine of them, uh, the tumor after treatment and within seven to 10 weeks, we do not see any tumor on the MI the, the volume that was treated was reabsorbed by the body entirely. Um, and then we also, interesting enough, we also did a cohort of rats with partial tumor ablation. So in this cohort, we treated 50 to 75% of the tumor. So as you can see here, the yellow arrow shows actually the targeted volume where the blue arrow was the residual tumor that we left behind intentionally. Um, and it was interesting enough because we want to see what happens to the residual tumor, but to our surprise that 10 weeks later, this tumor, you know, both are treated and the residual tumor left behind, both are gone. It also results in the complete absorption of that volume. And when we look at the histology, we see a millimeter region of calcification, some calcification, Fabrin, some scar, you know, the, the, uh, what you would see, you would see in a scar tissue typically with normal liver surrounding it, just a, you know, minimal region and no tumor cells. So that was uh, really, you know, great results, but, but surprising. So that motivated us to actually look into the immune response that induced by histotripsy. So this shows the immune cells we measured at day three and day 10 after a histotripsy treatment of the tumor. And in this study, we also treated just part of the tumor, 50 to 75%. And what we see is that day 10, the CDH T cell, uh, there's a significant increase of CDH T cells compared to the control. There's also increase of other immune cells, HMGB1, CDH, uh, H T cell, uh, CD H T cell, CD four T cells, neutral fields, uh, tumor specific T cells, dendritic cells. We see an increase compared to the control. And the compared to radiation therapy and radio frequency uh, thermal ablation approach, we see an increased, a more potent immune response that generated by histotripsy compared to those. And we also look at the systemic immune response. So in this study, we, uh, uh, Dr. Cho's group, they implanted two tumor. Uh, there's you know, one tumor that was treated by histotripsy, and then the other one we didn't treat. And we look at the immune cells in both the treated his, uh, site and the controlactral site that didn't receive any treatment. And it was really interesting the control side that didn't receive the treatment at day 10, we also see increased, significantly increased uh, CD T cell infiltration and other immune response, immune cells as well uh, in, the, in the untreated side. And a step further, uh, we um, inoculate the mice with uh, pulmonary metastasis. So induce pulmonary metastasis to this mice. Uh, uh, again, so, um, by Cho's group, and then we conducted a histotripsy treatment of the primary tumor. So the lung is not touched. Uh, and 10 days later, uh, harvest the lung, and we found that the lung metastasis in the histotripsy treatment group is also significantly lower 
than the control group. So this all point to a potent immune response, both local and systemic, induced by histotripsy. And so our current hypothesis is why, why would we see that? And the hypothesis we have is that, uh, so histotripsy uh, mechanically disrupt the cell membrane, but unlike radiation using ionization, or thermal approach that heat up uh, using heating that can denature a protein, um, the histotripsy is a mechanical process where the uh, tumor antigen, that protein is still intact. And while we uh, disrupt the cell membrane, release the tumor antigen out, and that expose it to the body. And not only locally in the treatment region, the acellular debris also goes to the bloodstream when it's uh, getting reabsorbed by the body. So it really you know, exposed the tumor antigen to the body to stimulate that immune response and tell body that the cancer is here, now the immune, uh, immune system can attack. And also there is this immunological cell death that induced by histotripsy that trigger other pathway of the immune, uh, immune path signal pathway. Uh, and all together uh, stimulate this uh, potent local and systemic immune response. So with all that knowledge we have learned from uh, the PIC study and from the rodent tumor uh, study, uh, there was a phase one clinical trial that was conducted last year uh, by, led by Dr. John Vidal Jove in Barcelona uh, and in collaboration with Fred and Tim from University of Wisconsin and a system used uh, by Histrosonics, produced by Histrosonics and trial sponsored by Histrosonics. And so this is a phase one trial where the patient population wise, uh, there are liver cancer patients, eight uh, patients, 11 tumors uh, with tumor size in a range of 0.5 to 2.3 centimeter. Only one tumor is a primary liver cancer, um, hepatocellular carcinoma. The others are uh, metastasis. And uh, the uh, the initial look, uh, we're initially looking at as a safety study with a primary endpoint would be the technical success, whether we are able to, we were able to actually treat a plant ablation volume. Uh, where the plant ablation volume is a tumor showing on ultrasound image, demonstrated by ultrasound image here with a centimeter margin surrounding the tumor. And uh, uh, in all 11 tumors, 100% technical success was achieved. And in one tumor, that was that small tumor, 0.5 uh, centimeter, uh, really small, cannot uh, see on ultrasound well, there was a mistargeting. Uh, other than that one case, uh, 10 of the 11 tumors were effectively treated and, um, by histotripsy and confirmed by the MRI image. And the secondary endpoint is a contraction of the bleached tumor volume. And within two months, uh, uh, demonstrated by MRI, we have seen that it really the treated the tumor, uh, the volume, just like what we have seen in the pig and the rodent tumor study, uh, reabsorbed by the body and quickly contracted. So average of 88% of the tumor, uh, the treatment volume contraction within two months. And, and what I find is most interesting, exciting, is that in two of the eight patients, well, uh, also epscopal effect was observed, uh, demonstrated by uh, global tumor volume. So there are distant tumors that's not treated, also showing the tumor volume on control and reduction on MRI. And also there's a global tumor biomarker such as CEA and AFP uh, a drop in those two patients. So what I want to add here, those patients are end stage patients. Uh, they have metastasis in their liver, uh, all, all of them. Uh, and so this, uh, this effect uh, really uh, is uh, in kind of unexpected from our end, uh, but a confirmed part of the uh, immunological study we have seen in the rodent uh, liver tumor model. So to summarize, uh, for the cancer treatment, uh, we have shown histotripsy can be used to safely treat a plant ablation volume in the liver through intact chest and rib cage. Uh, there is a rapid absorption of the treated volume. And this allow the early imaging identification if there's any incomplete treatment. Um, we also have seen epscopal effect induced by histotripsy 
uh, and due to the immune response, uh, both observed in the animal and in the human, there's still a lot of space for future development here. Um, so that's the that's end of my webinar. And again, it takes a village to all this work. It's really a, a work by a large group of people. I am really thankful uh, and fortunate to work with a large group of people at University of Michigan, my collaborators with University of Wisconsin, Histrosonics team, the Barcelona team, and the Virginia Tech team and the funding resources. So this is a picture showing um, not all the collaborations, but a good number of them. We had a History Tipsy Summit uh, last year in September in Ann Arbor. Um, and uh, thank you all for your time uh, to be here uh, with me. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. And also you can contact me. This is my email and our uh, website for more information. And uh, by the end, I also really want to thank the Focus Ultras on the Foundation to give me the opportunity to be here uh, to share with you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that very fascinating talk. Um, so we're going to open the Q&A session now. So if you have a question, please submit it via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Looks like we have a very engaged, looks like we have a very engaged audience today. Um, so I'm going to try to get through as many of these questions as we can. Um, so the first question for you, Jen, is how close to bone and air structures can you safely target using histotripsy? So we have uh, uh, treated, uh, you know, I don't have really a specific number. Uh, in the brain treatment, uh, uh, the, the score is a uh, five millimeter. And then in the uh, liver cancer wise, uh, uh, I, I would say somewhere around, my experience is somewhere around uh, a centimeter, uh, five millimeter, between five millimeter to one centimeter is a, a region that I have seen in animal studies uh, that can be safely used. Very interesting. Okay, so we have uh, multiple questions interested about phase aberration corrections when you are trying to do histotripsy through either the skull or through the intact rib cage. Uh, so we have, uh, first of all, with all the liver cancer treatment that you have seen, um, we actually didn't do any aberration correction. Um, and, um, and we can. So I'm going to talk about uh, first is that when you go through rib cage and you skull too, uh, the, the waveform, the beam profile, you will expect to have increased side lobes uh, and uh, reduce the main lobe. But one great thing here uh, is that cavitation is a threshold phenomenon. So what we have observed is that as long as uh, the side lobe is below the intrinsic cavitation threshold, and the main lobe is above a cavitation threshold, then we can generate cavitation only within the treatment region and not out in the side lobes. And what we have been doing is that we use ultrasound guidance to uh, slowly uh, to ramp up from low to high until we see cavitation generated by the main lobe. And then we use that pressure level right above the threshold uh, you know, by and only exceeding in the main low and use that to do the treatment uh, to, to try to avoid the cavitation that generated by the side low. So that's what we use for the, uh, the liver treatment. Um, but we can definitely do aberration correction. And that's, that's the next thing. So for the skull, uh, you know, going through the skull, uh, we can do two steps. Uh, one is that uh, we can use uh, the established method, which is uh, using the CT scan on um, to uh, extrapolate the skull thickness and the speed of the sound in the, uh, assuming a speed of sound in the skull and use that to do modeling and to do aberration correction that way, which is basically what's uh, being done right now with a, uh, with a current uh, MI guided focus ultrasound uh, treatment. Uh, another thing we have been doing is that we, because we have transmit to receive capability now so that we can actually receive the cavitation emission signal by all the element modules on our histotripsy array. And that allows us to calculate the time of travel uh, to 
uh, between the, the cavitation site to focal site to the array elements and then use that to do aberration correction. Um, there are other things, so those are the main things we have been looking at. Great. So you touched on this a little bit, um, but we had a question, how finely does the peak negative pressure need to be controlled to avoid undesirable effects? What happens if you go above the upper limit? Uh, so the, uh, the cavitation, what we have seen if the pressure is too high, first of all, again, you know, really you can't really measure that pressure amplitude in situ. When you have different patients coming in, right, you, you, you can have a patient with a BMI above 35, though you can have a patient that's with a BMI below 20. Uh, so to actually accurately measure the in situ pressure, it's, it's difficult. So we have been relying on the real time uh, feedback of the ultrasound imaging showing the cavitation to tell us when the cavitation is generated when we are right above the threshold. Uh, and if uh, the too high amplitude of the peak negative pressure uh, is used or just in general too high pressure is used, uh, uh, there are a couple of things that may happen. One is that you can generate cavitation outside the treatment zone. Uh, and especially if it's near uh, gas pockets, uh, then you can, you know, bow, for example, then you may generate cavitation in locations outside and cause uh, some uh, undesirable uh, damage. And secondly is that if uh, too high amplitude is generated and treating through the ribcage, and if the duty cycle is not sufficiently low, and that also can accumulate uh, enough of the energy deposition that may cause uh, potential uh, thermal damage to uh, tissue surrounding the rib. Uh, so there, there are some uh, side effects, but we really are trying to control the treatment uh, such that you, you know, it's right above the threshold. Excellent. So there is quite a bit of interest on your liver cancer clinical trial, specifically on the patients who showed an abscopal effect. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about how those patients may have differed from the rest of the population in terms of whether they had other treatments on board before the histotripsy, and or if you have any additional preliminary finding, particularly immune analysis, that would be very interesting. Uh, I feel sorry to say that I don't really know. Um, this is really the early study uh, that, was, that was done with uh, unexpected results, I have to say. Uh, so I would refer, and, and the, 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 the study was done, I'm, I'm not a clinician, so I would refer those uh, people who are interested in this to contact Dr. Vidal Jove, uh, Dr. Fred Lee, Tim um, Zelowitz at Wisconsin. So they are the people who have more information on the clinical trial uh, and all histosonics, uh, um, but uh, those questions, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, I actually don't have an answer. Of course. Um, so we have quite a few questions as well about the uh, size capability in terms of your targeting. So what is the smallest and largest lesion you can create with histotripsy? And what is the, um, I guess, the imaging resolution in terms of tracking whether you're on target or not? There's a upper limit wise, really, there's no upper limit. Uh, if uh, I think the upper limit will be the treatment time. Uh, eventually, the clinicians will lose patient, right, patients, right? So, they, uh, so uh, we, uh, the, the treatment volume size can, you can treat a volume by either electronic focal steering or mechanical steering. Uh, electronic focal steering, that really, there's a limit there because eventually you run out of pressure and steering range. But when combined with mechanical focal steering, then that can be used to treat as large volume as you want. The smallest uh, focal zone, uh, treatment zone, is defined by the specific transducer, the focal volume of specific transducer. So really depending on the design, a higher frequency will give you a smaller focal zone and a smaller uh, a lower frequency will give you, uh, you know, a bigger focal zone. So, you know, if we are talking about the smaller focal zone we have ever created uh, with histotripsy in our lab, uh, we actually have a paper published, if anyone is interested, called Microtripsy, uh, where we were able to use higher frequency histotripsy to create actually uh, lesions on the order of hundreds of microns. Um, so it really depends on the, the transducer. 
we also have quite a bit of interest on looking at what the mechanical characteristics of tissue are that affect the threshold for cavitation. So specifically, there's some interest in clot versus normal tissue, um, as well as calcified tissue. Right. So uh, I, what I didn't report here, our group actually has done really uh, quite a bit of uh, work uh, in terms of uh, thrombolysis. So we have been able to use hysotripsy to treat, uh, to mechan to really like dissolve clots uh, uh, into, uh, again, ACR debris smaller than eight micron, uh, both uh, clots that's fresh as well as retracted clots uh, that's more aged. Uh, we have trying to use hysotripsy to treat calcified plaque. So we try some, um, really hard plaque that uh, from cadaver. And what we found out is that a calcified uh, human plaque is really hard to treat. Uh, and, and not just calcified, it's calcified plaque mixed with fibrin and collagen together. Uh, so that is someone seemed to, to be very resistant to hysteropsy damage. Um, but interesting, another interesting thing I want to point out that we, we also found out that like, treating the clots and because typically the clots mechanical property wise seem to be, the vessel wall seem to be more resistant uh, than the clot. So we are, were able to, in our study, able to remove the clots while still the vessel structure remain intact. Well, that provided a perfect segue into the next question. Um, which is actually about this exact issue. So if you are um, ablating either a tumor um, or I guess just generally in the brain and you're releasing all this debris into an intact blood vessel, uh, could there be issues with downstream clotting and or uh, do you think that may actually affect um, whether the tumor is able to regrow quickly because it still has a blood supply? Well, what we have, so, so first is that we, when we see blood vessels remain intact, what we found is when we treat a tumor, tumor vessels, uh, you know, they are leaky tumor vessels. Those are really easily destroyed. So we actually have seen, we don't see tumor vessels remain intact. We see normal vessels remain intact. Uh, and, and also uh, in terms of the embolization, uh, that was actually a major concern when we were conducting the thrombolysis treatment. And it was actually very interesting. And I was trying to uh, see if I can show a video here. Uh, what we have seen in the thrombolysis study is that we were not, uh, we checked the lung, we checked the brain, because we were so concerned about potential embolization uh, uh, that can be caused by the, you know, just the pieces of the, uh, pieces of the fragments of the clots. And it was interesting enough that in the study that we conducted in the pig, we were not able to find any evidence of uh, embolization uh, in the thrombolysis study. And I wanna share a video here. And so what you are seeing the video here is actually a, a, a vessel phantom where you have the flow from left to the right. And I'm going to actually, in this study, we're feeding a clock fragment here. So I will start a video here. So a clock fragment will be fed into here and it should just go wipe away, right? But what happens here is that what we see is this fragments actually, clot fragment um, getting trapped within this cavitation zone generated by histotripsy. So it turned out that histotripsy actually uh, in, in a vessel, Created this vortex actually has this motion trapping the uh, clot fragments uh, and preventing uh, any um, you know large fragments going downstream to cause embolization. So so this actually is what we think why in our our thrombolysis study we never seen any embolization uh, in the lung or, or in the, in the brain. So um, I hope that. Um, also, quite, but I, I do agree that it needs further investment. Like uh, we cer certainly intend to study this further. So I cannot say it conclusively, uh, you know, that in the tumor treatment, if it's also the case, but this is what we have seen in the thrombolysis study. Thank you so much for this. This has been a fantastic talk. Um, I think we're going to wrap up for today so we don't keep you uh, online all day. Um, for the audience members, if you have questions that weren't addressed, um, we will attempt to do that via email. And if you have further questions, please feel free to send them in to info at fussfoundation.org. 
And for today, that concludes our webinar. Thank you again for being with us here today.